We're going to continue the series of messages from God's Word about total fitness and, and you know, the whole area of financial fitness. And today, I want to focus on the subject of making good money. That's a title that some Christians would find offensive right off the bat because there is no such thing. You can't make good money. Profit is bad. Property is bad. If you are truly spiritual and truly Christian, you would not think very much about making money, and you certainly wouldn't think about keeping any of it as your own. I'll give you an example uh, from a rather famous theologian, Paul Tillich. The effect of the capitalist system upon society and upon every individual in it takes the typical form of possession, that is, of being possessed. Its character is demonic. Any serious Christian must be a socialist because you don't have possessions. They possess you. It's like demon possession if you have any property of your own because if you have property, your property has you. And so, um, not everybody would agree with that statement, but there are Christians who, even if they wouldn't agree with Tillich that uh, property always possesses you like a demon does, they would nonetheless feel a little bit grubby about going out and making money or about having it, and they have an uneasy conscience because they know that Jesus told a rich young man to sell what he had and to follow him. They know that the Bible says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, they know that Jesus said, hey, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So riches or the creation of wealth or the earning of money seems like, well, maybe kind of a necessary evil, but still an evil. And so you go out there and you chug away at your job and you spend an hour or two in church on Sundays trying to feel close to God. And then you do that miserable money-making thing because you got to make a living somehow and you got to eat. But yeah, it's a dirty job and somebody's got to do it. And so we cut off a vast portion of our life, of our work hours, of the way that we earn and invest and of the things that we own. And we may feel somewhat guilty about them or we may just turn down our hearing aid when we hear what the Bible says about some of the dangers of wealth. And it is important to have an understanding of wealth that is a biblical one. Socialism has been tried and found wanting. Everywhere it has been tried, it has resulted in government oppression because it says no person owns anything. Government owns everything. And giving absolute power over all economic um, decisions to government makes it a very oppressive system. And of course, it also is an economic disaster. Um, socialists must love people in poverty because they sure put a lot of them there. They have, over the course of history, wrecked the economy of every society where it's been tried. So, um, the, the concern of socialism, nonetheless, socialism seems to spring up again and again. And where does it spring up? Where there are vast inequalities of wealth, where some people don't seem to have much opportunity, or where they resent the differences in income. So, there's never going to be a shortage in the market for socialism because there are always going to be people who are disadvantaged and cut off from opportunity. But that doesn't mean that the making of money or the owning of property is always a demonic thing. We'll just look at what some of the Proverbs have to say about wealth and then what some other scriptures do. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. Just uh, notice your wealth, your crops. Whose? You actually have wealth. You actually have crops. The assumption of the Bible is that you're going to own some things. And when you own those things, then you're to honor God with those things that you own with the result of the labors that you've produced. And when you honor God with the things that he's given you, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. If you're wise, the Bible says, with me wisdom are riches and honor in during wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. 
I walk in the way of righteousness, along the paths of justice, bestowing wealth on those who love me and making their treasuries full. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. Misfortune pursues the sinner, but prosperity is the reward of the righteous. And you hear over and over again this sense of God blessing people who are in tune with him with wealth. When you look at some of the major figures of the Bible, you find some of them being very wealthy, and they're wealthy through God's blessing. Abraham. The Bible says Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. And how did he get so rich? Well, the Lord had blessed Abraham abundantly and he had become wealthy. He has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold. He got rich and God helped him get rich. Abraham's son Isaac planted crops in the land the same year, reaped a hundredfold. Why? Because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. Job, this man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. And then he lost it all. And then in the end, God gave him twice as much as he had before. Job didn't serve God because of his money. He continued to serve and worship God when he had none of it. But then God prospered him again. David became very wealthy. And he said, wealth and honor come from you. Everything comes from you. All this abundance comes from your hand and all of it belongs to you. And then David's life is summarized. He died at a good old age, having enjoyed long life, wealth, and honor. So again and again and again, you read of people who became wealthy through God's blessing in the New Testament too. You find that Jesus' ministry with him and his disciples is traveling and Jesus having no possessions of his own, but he still seemed to eat okay and he still seemed to be able to live. And that's explained by some of his followers provided for him out of their own resources, particularly some of the wealthier women who followed him. You find that Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, um, followed Jesus and helped assist in his burial. Uh, Lydia, a seller of purple and a merchant who was very prosperous, hosted um, Christian worship in her home. And, and again and again, you can see that people owned stuff. And some of them owned quite a bit. And they owned quite a bit through God's blessing. And therefore, it'd be very hard to say that all wealth is always bad and all wealth creation is something for Christians to be ashamed of and to shun. Solomon he was, had the opportunity to ask for one thing, and he asked for wisdom. And then God said, I will also give you wealth, riches, and honor, such as no king who was before you ever had, and none after you will have. And King Solomon made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stones. So that's kind of, and that was during uh, the reign of wisdom in the land of Israel. At the same time, Wealth, though a blessing from God, it isn't God. God gives riches. Riches aren't God. You use riches to serve God. You don't use God to get rich. There is a huge difference between using God to get rich and using riches to serve God. A faithful man will be richly blessed, but one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. If riches is such a good thing, shouldn't you be eager to get rich? But there's something about if your main itch is to get rich, then you've got a bad disease. The wealth seems to be a byproduct of something else, of wisdom, of honoring God, of serving Him. And if your main goal in life is to have money, you have a really, really serious problem. A greedy man stirs up dissension. You, you cause fights when... You're always wanting more and more and more for yourself. But he who trusts in the Lord will prosper. You have that paradox. The greedy guy gets trouble, and the one who's not greedy ends up prospering. In the New Testament, it just says greed is idolatry. It's making money your God. And so people who think that you use God to get money 
are described in the Bible as men of corrupt mind who've been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So the question is, what are you really eager for? If money is your number one goal in life, that is a way to fall into ruin and destruction. It will destroy relationships and supremely your relationship with God. So just eagerness to get rich, living for money, that's your main, main thing, is disastrous. Proverbs speaks of people who put their trust in money. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it an unscalable wall. A mighty fortress is our stocks. You know, something like that, maybe. Um, you know, they, the wealth of the rich is their fort of man. If you've got enough money, you can put yourself in a gated community. You can save for the future. You can seal the border. You can do everything to protect me, me, me. This is my fortified city. Well, they imagine it an unscalable wall. And Proverbs goes on to say, wealth is worthless in the day of wrath. But righteousness delivers from death. Money has its value, but saving you on the day of wrath, you say, God, you know, God doesn't take bribes. You say, God, here, here's a million. You know, will this save me on the day of wrath? No. Wealth is worthless. So if you think that a mighty fortress is my wealth, it will not protect you from the wrath of God. Only righteousness through Jesus Christ delivers from death. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. So, riches um, and property is not necessarily evil, but love of money and making it your God is absolutely evil and deadly. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. God is talking to people who are about to prosper. They've been in the desert a while. They're headed into the promised land. And it's going to go well. And they are going to get richer and richer. And when that happens, God says, it's going to be dangerous. You might say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And that's a very striking sentence. It is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And it is a dangerous thing when he gives you the ability to produce wealth. Just as every other good thing he gives us is dangerous. In the New Testament, it speaks of the doctrines of demons who say that marriage is bad. God gives the gift of marriage and of sexuality. And people find many, many ways to mess it up. And yet it is the doctrine of demons to say that marriage is bad. God gives food, lots of it, great tasting food. And it is the doctrine of demons to say that food is evil and you should have as little and as bad tasting of it as you can. That's what the Bible says. It's the doctrine of demons because God made that stuff for people to, be in, to enjoy it with thanksgiving. And yet we do find ways to mess up big time in our attitude toward food and our use of it. And the same thing happens with money. God gives wealth. And he gives the ability to produce wealth. And there are many ways to blow it and to make big mistakes in your attitude toward money and your use of money and the way that you get it. Many dishonest means of getting it. Many bad ways of spending it. And yet it comes from God. And so we need to have an overall positive attitudes um, toward wealth that it is one of God's good gifts in his creation. And the more you work and the more talent you have and the more opportunities that you seize, the more wealth you're going to create or help others create. And that's a good thing. But remember the Lord your God who gives you the ability to reduce wealth. So you don't say, wealth is bad. You keep on saying, God is good. 
And as long as you remember God is good and he is the giver of every good and perfect gift, then the wealth is not going to get that grip on your heart that it otherwise might. In fact, you're supposed to rejoice in your blessings. You and your families shall eat and shall rejoice in everything you've put your hand to because the Lord your God has blessed you. For the Lord your God will bless you in all your harvest and in all the work of your hands, and your joy will be complete. Now, if God blesses you, and if your work has turned out well, and if your bank accounts are looking good, is it your duty to feel guilty about that? The Bible says you should rejoice in what God's given you. I know that can be misused, and that means, therefore, I should take 17 vacations a year to the farthest, flight, you know, spend all my money on me, 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 and so on. But you really should enjoy with thanks things that God gives you, because otherwise um, you're really not receiving it with the thankful and joyful heart that God intended you to receive it with. So rejoice in the blessings God gives you. Just to quote again a few verses from Proverbs, the righteous eat to their heart's content but the stomach of the wicked goes hungry. The wealth of the wise is their crown, but the folly of fools yields folly. Humility and the fear of the Lord bring wealth and honor and life. So when God prospers you, it's a blessing from him. You can be thankful for it. If you become a prosperity gospeler, in a sense where you use God to get money, then you have flipped things around and made money your God. So let's think about making good money. And money, if it, money is a good thing to make. And when I talk about making good money, you know, the phrase usually means, well, I'm getting paid pretty well. I'm getting paid a lot of money. And we call that making good money. But we could use the phrase in more ways than that. You're making good money if you're making money in good ways. If you're doing it with hard work, honest business. If you're doing it with integrity. And you're doing it to really express who God meant you to be. You're fulfilling your calling and your purpose. Many people make their living doing something that they're good at, something that they are helping others with, and God gave them a niche and a purpose in life, and they're doing it well, and they're getting paid handsomely because of that. And you're making money in good ways because you're giving people things that they need and, and things that benefit them. You're providing some goods or services. You're helping them out big time. That's why you're getting paid. If you're doing something that nobody wants you to do, you don't get paid. Okay, that's, that's just the way it is, unless, you know, maybe you work for a Chicago politician. Um, you know, that might work sometimes where you just get paid to do nothing. But overall, in a free market, you usually get paid to do something that somebody actually does want. And so... You're making good money when you do something that somebody really wanted. Um, you know, when, when you help some computers to work better, you're helping somebody out. When you are good at baking and you make a cake for a special occasion, um, you're helping them out and you're getting helped out in return by getting paid well. When you lay some carpet or tile or wood flooring, somebody's house is nicer and your bank account is nicer because you did something for them that they wanted. Uh, when you help somebody with their health or with their nutrition, they're healthier and you're paid. So there, there's just one thing after another after another where you can do something and you're making good money because people wanted you to do that and you helped them out. Making good money also involves the ability to pay your bills. You're making enough to live on so you don't have to mooch off other people. That's a good thing. And we'll see more of what the Bible says about that. And you're also, when you make good money, you're making money to do good for others. For one thing, when you're part of a wider economy, you're usually helping others to flourish and prosper. When you're working with a company and helping them succeed, when you're buying something in a store, you're often helping the workers in the store, the owners of the company, and others to succeed. And also, of course, when you make money and you share some of that money with those who just can't make money for themselves because of their um, physical limits or other problems with their health or whatever the case might be, when you're sharing wealth with the truly needy, then your ability to make money is blessing and helping others. Michael Novak, a number of years ago, wrote a book called Business as a Calling, and the subtitle was Work as the Examined and the Examined Life. 
And in that book, Novak um, says business is about creating goods and services, jobs and benefits, and new wealth that didn't exist before. That's, that's uh, important to understand, by the way, because some people say there's a total amount of wealth in the world, and it is the job of government to divide it up and divvy it up equally. But that is an incorrect and economically ignorant way of seeing things. There isn't a limited amount. Uh, oil is worth nothing until people have changed it into... Oil sat around for thousands of years being worthless. Silicon was always there and sat around being worthless till somebody figured out how to make computer chips out of it. There are a good many things in the world where God has given resources and given us abilities, and when people use those abilities and those resources, they suddenly have a capacity to do things they previously couldn't, and wealth is created and expanded. So business is about creating goods and new wealth that didn't exist, and we didn't give ourselves, and Novak is a Catholic Christian writer, he says, we didn't give ourselves the personalities, talents, or longings that we were born with, when we fulfill these, these gifts from beyond ourselves, it's like fulfilling something that we were meant to do. And the, the classic title of that is vocation or calling, where we just have abilities and opportunities and the way that we're, that we're put together. And you find something that really clicks for you. That's a very exciting and fulfilling thing. It's a sense of having uncovered our personal destiny, a sense of having been able to contribute something worthwhile to the common public life something that wouldn't have been there without us, and something that we were good at, and something we enjoyed. It's important to have a biblical understanding of work and of wealth, because God meant you to rejoice in carrying out your calling and to be able to make a living through doing so. Another thing that um, making good money will do is it helps you pay the bills. You say, well, that doesn't sound like the most spiritual thing in the world. Well, no, it's not the most spiritual thing in the world, but if you don't do it, you're worse than a pagan. Okay, so you, you, you may not have risen to be the most spiritual thing in the world, but if you refuse to do it, you may be sinking below the lower pagans. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle. You know, the, the, if you read the book of Proverbs, I, I have, I think, 15 slides of statements from the book of Proverbs that I didn't put in this sermon that maybe I'll just read for you sometime what it says about the sluggard, the lazy bones, it ain't pretty. Okay, we'll just put it that way. Uh, Proverbs has zero good to say about those who are idle. And the New Testament had some people saying, well, Jesus could come back any time, and we'd hate to waste a lot of work if he's just going to show up anyway. So the apostle said, such people, we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. I will give just one quote from Proverbs. The leech has two daughters. Give, give, they cry. You want to be a leech? You want to be a little blood-sucking critter? You know, like I said, paying your own bills is not the height of spiritual achievement. But let's face it, being a blood-sucking leech isn't exactly being a saint either. He who robs his father or mother and says, it's not wrong. He's a partner to him who destroys. And here, it's probably not just talking about ripping off your mom and dad, but sometimes when mom and dad are elderly and weren't able to care for themselves anymore, um, Jesus even talked about that. He said, there are people who don't want to help pay mom and dad's bills when they get old. And they say, it's Corban. I, I, I'm giving it to the Lord. And Jesus said, you're supposed to honor your father and your mother. Uh, that's one of the basic commands, and you're breaking the command of God to just do your own thing. And uh, the Apostle Paul says, if anyone doesn't provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So again, a blood-sucking leech who denies the faith is not one of the world's great achievements in the spiritual realm. You know, we, we can talk about the importance of prayer and Bible reading and, and activities we consider more spiritual, but paying your own bills when you have the ability to do so is a very important thing. And if you have family members, not just your parents, the apostle says if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should first 
learn to put all their, put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. If any woman who is a believer has widows in her family, she should help them and not let the church be burdened with them so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. There are people who are really in need. And the Bible's um, process of handling that is to say, well, are there any Christians in the immediate family? They ought to just help with that. Because there, there are people who have great needs who also don't have many relatives. Um, and so the church can really kick in and help them. But if you've got somebody that you could take care of, then do it. And that, again, is one of the purposes of making good money. It helps you not to mooch off people needlessly. And it also helps you to provide for those who are within your domain and, and realm of care and responsibility. So, paying your bills. It's not the loftiest spiritual achievement, but it's kind of a bare minimum to keep you from being worse than an unbeliever. Then another thing about making good money is uh, you're helping people out, um, you're paying your bills, you're fulfilling your vocation, and you're lifting others up very often in the process of doing business. Um, Edward Johnson was the founder of Fidelity Investments, and I know uh, a couple of others of the early pioneers in mutual funds. They, they made money doing that, quite a bit of money. And yet the, the thing that excited them was not just the ability to make a ton of money at it. Because there was a time when the only people who could invest in stocks and bonds were people who were multimillionaires. Because you couldn't be sinking a whole bunch of, you know, your little bit of life savings into one stock that could go belly up. And the, and the millionaires, of course, had enough that they could buy stocks from a whole bunch of different things and diversify. The mutual funds made it possible to invest in many different stocks um, and you would, it would be a whole pool of money and you could invest and have some of the same advantages of those big, rich investors. And so Edward Johnson, who founded Fidelity, said it's a real thrill to try to give the small investor, of which our companies are mainly comprised, as good a job of investing as the big man gets. So you could actually invest in the stock market, you know, and you wouldn't have tons of money perhaps to do it, but rather than say I'm getting half a percent of interest, um, you invest it in there, you leave it a while, and it would grow just like the millionaire's money would grow. And so he got a lot of joy out of helping people to do that. Novak says, business has a special role to play in bringing hope, and not only hope, but actually economic progress to the billion or so truly poor people on this planet. Business is, bar none, the best real hope of the poor. You say, boy, that sounds like a gung-ho, you know, economic type person. But he says, business is the best real hope of the poor, and that's one of the noblest callings inherent in business activity, to raise up the poor. You very often will see in movies that the rich guy, the business tycoon, is the villain. And no doubt there are villainous tycoons around and villainous heads of big corporations. But just whom do you think generates wealth for people in the first place? A lot of questions are raised about um, people misusing wealth or exploiting things and the need to make everybody equal. But there are people who are good at creating wealth, who start stuff, and who launch companies and enterprises that hire people, and who expand things. Now again, um, the ability of people in poverty to be helped. What can help them? Well, there are different approaches. One is, you know, we should tax the rich more and then use tax money to help poor people. And there's a degree to which that's true. People who have benefited more from an economic setup can perhaps give more and then some of those who are unable to care for themselves can benefit from some of that. You also might take the approach, well, you know who ought to really be helping those who are in need are the Christians. The churches ought to be doing more. The churches ought to be generous with those in need. And so we should. We should, when we have surpluses of wealth, be ready to help those who are homeless, who are hungry, who can't provide for themselves. But the best way to help the most poor is for there just to be more opportunity in the first place and for them to have opportunity to earn their own living. And so government redistribution at times is 
worth doing to a degree. And certainly church charity and Christian generosity is important. But China and India have had more people come out of poverty in the last 30 years because of economic development than because of any amount of redistribution or charity that ever happened. So I'm not knocking all taxes or saying that all charity ought to be eliminated, but the role of making good money and creating good companies and launching good enterprises is, if you care about the poor, one of the best ways to help them. If the huge numbers of the poor in the world are ever to lift themselves out of poverty, they need people with ideas and capital to invest in creating the industries, jobs, and wealth that give the poor a base to build on. Opportunities and jobs are more valuable to them than handouts from a government that treats them like serfs. That's why there may even be moral components sometimes to trade policy. I'm not going to say what trade policy is the best. I am saying if your trade policy is aimed only at preserving your advantages and your wealth, then um, perhaps you want to re-examine it again. The ability to create wealth is a gift from God. The guy saying this is Ron Sider. Some of you might know who he is, others maybe won't. Ron Sider is a guy who's given his whole life to helping poor people. He wrote a book, uh, Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, in which he spoke of how we're so wealthy and we're not helping people who are in need nearly as much as we should. And he's right. And that's where his heart is, helping poor people and sometimes telling rich people, now you gotta, you know, you got to get with it and do more. But Ron Sider, having believed in all that, still says the ability to create wealth is a gift from God. And God has blessed humans with awesome power not only to reshape the earth, but to produce new things that have never been. Jesus' parable of the talents sharply rebukes those who fail to use their skills to multiply their resources. Just responsible creation of wealth is one important way persons obey and honor the Creator. So, to create wealth in a good way is part of your duty before the Creator. One of the ways you honor God. So when you go off to work tomorrow morning, you don't say, oh, now I'm off to that kind of unspiritual, grubby business of making a living. You say, yahoo, I'm going out to create some wealth. I'm going to create some wealth for me. I'm going to help to expand and create opportunity for other people. If you're somebody who starts a business or runs a business, you're blessing other people. And so that's an exciting and wonderful opportunity. Your entrepreneurial energies, says George Weigel, have made jobs available to others. Your success has meant success in investment, in employment, in personal satisfaction. For th you know, this, this, he's talking to big time companies here, for thousands of your employees and shareholders. Through the tax system and through your philanthropic activities, you're making a significant contribution to the common good. So he says, uh, you know, you're doing all of the above. You're expanding the economy and you're paying taxes. So if taxes are doing some good, then you're doing that. If you're giving generously, then you're doing good through that means. So you're multiplying success and helping people in a lot of different ways. So the reason I'm saying all this is that we want to have that sense of enthusiasm and gratitude and blessing when we go out there to make good money and then use it for God's glory. And at the same time, we have to remember what the Bible is teaching, that one of the reasons you make good money is to share with those in need. The Bible says, you know, the one who's been stealing should quit stealing and do something useful so that he may have something to give to those in need. So you do something useful so you can pay your own bills and then go beyond that to give to those in need. He who despises his neighbor's sins, but blessed is he who is kind to the needy. He was kind to the poor, lends to the Lord, and he will reward him. You know, we talked a minute ago about mutual funds. Those are nice. You might want to invest in God while you're at it. You know, great. We talked last week, you know, whose money is it? Last time we um, spoke about financial fitness. You give to the Lord and, and you give for his causes, but he who is kind to the poor, lends to the Lord, and he will reward him. He who gives to the poor will lack nothing. But he who closes his eyes to them receives many curses. So again, if you're making good money, one of the things that makes it good money is the fact that you're willing to use some of it to bless others when God gives you more than you need. So make money in good ways to fulfill your calling and purpose. You're providing desirable goods and services 
Um, you're making good amounts so that you can pay the bills and not mooch off others and be one of those two blood-sucking leeches that says give, give. Um, and you're making money to do good for others by helping others to flourish and prosper, expanding the economy, hiring them, giving them opportunities, and sharing wealth with the truly needy who can't provide for themselves. And so for all these reasons, the Bible encourages us to be people who welcome God's blessing of wealth, who pursue God's will. Sometimes if you have a special calling, you will forsake all wealth and do something else that doesn't pay just because it needs doing and because God called you to it. Sometimes if you live in an unjust system, you can work your tail off and not have it pay off hardly at all. You'll be a slave. Um, the Bible says even if you're a slave, whatever you do, do it all for the Lord um, because you're serving the Lord Christ. But in a just system or in a somewhat just system, there is the opportunity to make good money and to bless others through it. And that's a part of financial fitness, the ability to generate wealth and to share it. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we, we praise you that you are a great God, that you are more precious than all the wealth of the world. We praise you too, Lord, that when our wealth could not do anything to rescue us from your wrath, you gave your precious Son and his priceless blood for our salvation. We pray, Lord, that we will seek first the kingdom and your righteousness, and that as we do that, then we'll also take responsibility for the abilities we have, for the opportunities that come our way, and to receive any wealth that you provide as a blessing from you with glad hearts and with generous hearts. We pray, Father, for our own church and for those who are in it, some, Lord, who may feel frustrated in their work or in their employment opportunities. We pray that they may have the ability to really put their talents to work in the right setting. We pray, Lord, for those who are involved in businesses and various endeavors and ask that they can work with their whole heart as for you. We pray for those who may have a dream of, of starting up a business of their own or doing something like that, that they can understand what's the right timing and how to do it well and how to do it to your honor. We pray, Lord, that each one of us in our own way may honor you with our wealth and receive it as a blessing and gift from you. Father, we pray that you will help our nation and our world too. We know that there are many hard decisions that are made by leaders. Some of them, Lord, are maybe designed to perpetuate inequality or unjust injustice. And we pray, Lord, that you will bring about uh, just a greater prosperity for people in parts of the world where there is so much misery and hunger still, and lack of the necessities. We pray, Lord, that where we have opportunity to help in various ways, you will make us faithful to you and to them. We ask this in Jesus' name.